Welcome to the Hollywood Outsider, an award-winning weekly entertainment podcast. On this very episode, we'll be discussing Matt Reeves directing the reinvention of probably the second most popular comic book character out there as Robert Pattinson picks up the cowl and the cape to exact vengeance as the Batman. And stick around after the Batman discussion, and we will be talking about vigilantes. Let's get on with the show. My name is Aaron Peterson. Joining me today, my fellow ho Troy Heinrichs. He's only the second in your eyes because Spider-Man comes first in your world. I'm sure he's like the number one character in many people's spectrums. I'm Can just we agree financially, fiscally, that uh, Spider-Man is a much more popular superhero? Well, that's only because of Batman and Robin. Batman and Robin wasn't there. We would have done better. The financial would have been better for Batman overall. I don't think so. Look, here's a little are we, talking, are we talking like all of comics and in anime and movies and no, superhero. I'm just talking like superhero. I think Spider-Man trumps Batman. I mean, in a fight, Spider-Man definitely wins for sure. Although those are fighting words. I don't know. <laughs> Look at basically the most recent box office, right? Spider-Man is what nearing 2 billion and basically it's opening weekend. And granted that was a third movie, but still it's, I mean, it's the third movie of the third reboot as well. So just saying Spider-Man it's more family friendly. So therefore it sells more tickets. How about that? But it also, but it also had like, you know, a gimmick or two in that movie that made it. You shut your whore mouth. Billion. That was not a gimmick. That was genius. And everybody should be commended and probably given like the medal of honor, but give it to a lot worse things. <laughs> so I, I think medal of honor, medal of freedom, whatever the hell it's called, uh, needs to go to whoever came up with some of those gimmicks. You I'm just saying bitch. if that gimmick would have been applied here and certain past Cape Crusaders would have showed up. You think it would have been $6 billion, $6 billion easily. Cause there were what there's been six, right? <laughs> you think if like Michael Keaton and Ben Affleck and Christian Bale and Val and, Kilmer and Adam West <laughs> showed up. And yeah, Adam Val West. Kilmer. They, George it's Clinton, a billion, uh, billion dollars a piece right there. There boom, you go. Boom, 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 boom. I get you. I get you. <laughs> You're insane. I think if George Clooney showed up, it would lose money. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that's not fair. I mean, he wasn't the problem with that movie. He was God. not the problem with that movie. I just rewatched that. It is awful. Like, legitimately awful. Batman and Robin is awful. Awful. Ugh. <laughs> it's not aged well either. The cool and cold and ice jokes. Dear God, there's a lot of them. And there, you know, there's a scene in the very, you don't. Nah, this is, doesn't pertain to the Batman at all, but you know what? connected <laughs> there's a in the very opening scene of batman and robin you know they're going after mr freeze do you, and <laughs> batman and robin are together and they click their heels together three times i guess so there's no place like the cave there's no place like the bat cave and ice skates come out of their boots when was that ever necessary in any other situation ever in the history of gotham city that they would need ice skates it's like the dumbest thing I've ever, I've ever heard of. Oh my I god! I mean, it freezes like freezing the ground. I mean, I can understand. It's yeah, but this is the first time they ever met Mister Mister Freeze, Doctor Freeze, whatever the hell his freaking name is. This is the first time they ever met his ass, and they just they immediately had ice skates on their boots. It was just, it's so dumb. It was oh my god, it was so dumb. Just I don't understand who greenlit all that movie. But anyway, we're talking about the Batman. Now, Amanda uh, Sink might join us as we go. She was delayed, so maybe she'll make the podcast, maybe not. But we wait for no person (laughs) here when we're recording. We got stuff to do. So, Troy, thanks for joining me for this. Before we get into the actual movie, the film of The Batman, I want to know if you have a favorite Batman or Batman. Maybe maybe you really like the Batman. I don't know which way you just swing. I mean, it's hard to say, right? Because we never got a true Ben Affleck standalone Batman movie. Amen. Thanks for saying it. Yeah, I, I really think Ben Affleck portrayed both sides of the coin. He was able to be a good Bruce Wayne. He was able to be a good Batman at the same time. I don't think anybody has ever been able to pull that off completely. Not even Michael Keaton, where you get both the you know handsome, successful billionaire and then the dark gruesome, I'm going to come through any shadow I can, you know bat <laughs> I guess. and he was like he worked out so much he looked like he could beat someone's ass silly yeah for sure and apparently doesn't apply because you can beat someone's ass silly because my ass literally shook 
in the theater every single time Robert Pattinson baited on that glass. It's like, bam, my butt shook. Bam, my butt shook. It was awesome. I was like, yes. <laughs> the 4D, so is that the 4D experience or just the, the sound? No, system? that was just straight up AMC Dolby Atmos. I mean, nice. the, the bass on that was so just what it was. Every time you hit the glass, I was like, dude, that's so good. So good. Um, man, favorite one. That's tough. I mean, it's got to be George Clooney. <laughs> He'd be so happy to hear that. I found my one. I found my one. He was not the problem with that movie, though. George Clooney, I thought, could have been a good Batman as well. I don't think it would have been great, but I think he would have been a good See, Bruce Wayne, at least. Yeah, the hard part is, like, Christian Bale is the one you would say. But it's not because Christian Bale was a good Batman. It's because the movies were really good. Yeah. And so he just fits in there and was able to to fit the part. And he does have the kind of the Bruce Wayne swagger. So, I mean, like, if I had to pick one, I would have to go with Christian Bale. I'm a but, Ben Affleck guy, even though he didn't get his yeah. solo movies. I mean, it's a, it's amazing to me. The performance he puts in in Zack Snyder's Justice League and Batman versus Superman, like that's the Batman I want to see. And the way that he's just rock 'em sock 'em robots and basically fighting like Arkham Asylum in that Batman versus Superman, I really, really just love his performance. And I agree, the duality that he has between Bruce Wayne and Batman are very well orchestrated, very well performed. And I think Robert picked up on that, and I think Robert put put that into the character this time around as well. I did not like his Bruce Wayne, but we'll talk about that as, oh, as yeah, we yeah, go. No. We'll no. talk about that as we go. But yeah, yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> I, I loved his Batman, like which yeah. this movie is primarily Batman. I mean, the majority of it is is Batman. Now we are going to talk about it with spoilers, but what we're going to do is we're going to first uh, explain what the movie is about, and then we'll kind of give you overall thoughts on the film overall, and then we'll get into the, the details. Okay. So here's what the Batman's about. If you didn't know, it has echoes of tone from films like Clute, the French connection seven and Zodiac. I would argue the crow as very much a visual mm-hmm. aesthetic to the crow for sure. The Batman stars, Robert Pattinson, sorry, Pattinson as billionaire Bruce Wayne. You might've heard his parents died when he was a kid. You might've seen that a few times. And his whole life has been consumed with grief and anger over their loss, causing him to don a cape and cowl and torture criminals on the streets as the Batman. It's hard to say that without trying to do the voice. We begin this movie in year two of his crusade, and he or illustrates exactly what he's been doing, which is striking the fear into the hearts of criminals. And there's a lot of shades of The Long Halloween, which is a Batman comic, if you ever read it, uh, that to kind of take root as the mayor is murdered on Halloween. The Batman has been beating the level thugs, like I mentioned, and now a series of additional murders are basically riddled with clues left specifically for the Batman. So who is this masked man murdering all these elitist, quote unquote, white privileged assholes? Well, it's the Riddler, and he's a creepy unknown who wants Bruce on his side for some reason, some nefarious reason, and now the Batman must team up with Commissioner Gordon to track him down before he kills again. And also, there's a little bit of a secret as to why. Troy... Thoughts on the movie overall, before we get into spoilers, overall, when you walked out of the Batman, and I know, here's the difference. I read a lot of the comics. You are not a comic aficionado. You just know the movies. Correct. So I'm kind of curious, you know, where do you, where do you land on this version of the Batman, this, this 37th reboot? Yeah. I mean, for me, Batman, I grew up watching Adam West and Boom Pow and all that fun, you know, comic-y stuff on TV. Nah, 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 and nah, nah, and nah, it's nah, like, nah. it's it's fun. It's good entertainment. But when you get into the movie side of things, like Michael Keaton's was good because it had kind of that comical feel to it, the way that the, the, the enemies were put together. But in this case, I really like the, he, he's a vigilante, but he is a cop at the same time. Like he works with Commissioner Gordon. He is like a police officer, in a lot of ways. And because of that, I think that this was really well done to showcase the ability to be both the vigilante, but yet the detective at the same time, especially at a point in the movie when he actually goes in and arrests somebody rather than just beating him to a pulp and tying him up and leaving him for the boys in blue to pick up later. I, I think that the, what you get from Robert Pattinson in this movie is a really great understanding of you know, trying to find his way in this second year of his crusade to know like, Hey, I can't do things a certain way. I have to do things more above board, but yet at the same time, 
if I get pissed off, I'm still going to be the freaking emo guy that I want to be because I'm still really, really angry about some things that have happened in my life. <laughs> and I think he does a really good job balancing all of that together, you know, with this stellar cast of the ability of bringing in f- fame names that you're going to know, right? The Penguin, you know, you, the Riddler, Catwoman, uh, Commissioner Gordon. You're going to get all of these characters in this you know, melting pot of information all tied up into this one great noir story that I think was just super unexpected, even though Matt Reeves is amazing, you know, Planet of the Apes, right, comes to mind, you know, he's part of the J.J. Abrams club, you know, it's scored by Michael Giacchino, so it's already got great music out of the gate and how they, you know, work the score through the entire thing. The overall movie is just freaking amazing and awesome, except for the runtime. Yeah, it's a it's a little long and... You know, I, I thought this was fantastic that, you know, so many people have complained about Zack Snyder's use of slow motion and the dark and gritty visuals that he tends to use. All that applies here. I mean, yeah, there's no slow motion, but Batman and every character in this movie walks into rooms so freaking slow. I think you could you could carve 20 minutes off the runtime just by making them walk at a normal pace. Honestly, I truly believe that. It's amazing to me. Amazing how slow everybody walks. It's parts yeah. of it are great, but then when it keeps happening, like at the very beginning of the movie, you see Batman as he kind of shows up at a crime scene and he's walking slow to kind of assess the situation because the police don't really want him there other than Commissioner Gordon. So I get why he's walking slow into that room, but he does it throughout the movie. Like every single room he enters or every time he goes into any space, it takes forever. It's so long. It's so long. And I would say, like, don't give up on it because it is really, 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 really good. It's really good. But that yeah. that first ten minutes, I'm like, oh my god, this is going to be so slow and so See, boring. I was captivated the first ten minutes. I really, I mean, I thought it it got longer as it went. The the last act, I thought, uh, especially because I'm like, why is he still walking slow in the rooms? But it's, but overall, I I really thought that the pacing wasn't bad and it was engaging throughout. Personally, yeah. And I thought, fantastic cast. We're going to talk about some of the characters that are prominent here and the actors that are playing them. But overall, as a as a movie, it was nice to see the detective, the world's greatest detective, even if he could have detected a little better. But it was nice to see that aspect of Batman be focused on and kind of see Batman while he f- tried to find his footing, while he, you know, we start with where he's at vengeance and where he's going is kind of the the whole arc of the of the story. There's a, there's a lot of great things here. I don't think it's the best Batman movie. I still think that's Dark Knight, but it but it's a damn good Batman movie. But even in terms of Dark Knight, I mean, this really has that kind of feel to it where every single time it feels like the Batman has figured it out. Mm-hmm. There's always one more trick up the Riddler's sleeve, and I think that just makes it super unnerving because you just don't know when is the movie actually going to end. Yeah, and where's it going? You know, there's some there's some twists. Okay, so we're going to get into some spoilers here. So at this point, if you haven't seen the movie, I would recommend you skip because this is going to it's going to be spoiled. So here you go. Last warning. All right. So Matt Reeves choice to focus on noir detective, the seven like tone. I still say, you know, he keeps saying seven in interviews. Therefore, I, I've seen it from, you know, uh, viewers all over the place as well. I, I get the seven aesthetic. I agree. It's there. But every time I'm watching the movie, I felt very much like the crow where the city is a character in the movie. It's very much dark and rainy and and just bruising. And it really feels like Batman's inner psyche to a large degree in terms of the world that we're seeing. How did you feel about Matt Reeves' choice to to focus on this very noir, almost almost old fashioned viewpoint? Yeah, and I would say it's almost not even that old fashioned because uh you know, movie both of you and I liked a lot was uh, Reminiscence with oh, yeah. Jackman. Yep. And I felt like this was almost like if Reminiscence was Gotham, like it could be the same world almost. It felt like it was that dark gangster mob underground crime syndicate type of feel. And that it was just you didn't know who was working for who and who was in cahoots with who. And I, and just unraveling that I thought was really fascinating. And I, I love just the Matt's choice on color 
uh, from just the opening credits with the WB logo and all red and then just the Batman and big red letters on the screen. And then you get that kind of red tone, you know, especially when you see cars or other uh, murders going down, you get this like just red hue in a lot of the early goings of the movie. I, th- I think that's just, it just sets up a very uh, mysterious vibe from the jump. You know, it's not boom, pow action, funny Batman. It is truly a dark sinister world that he's trying to make better uh, throughout this whole process. Yeah. I, I was very impressed with the choice to go here, even though I feel like we've seen this world before. And and it was funny. I was talking to somebody that likes Batman, but they prefer like a very cartoony aesthetic. So they didn't even want to see this one. And they chose not to go see this one because they prefer like the Joel Schumacher movies or, you know, Tim Burton's movies where it felt more of right out of the pages of the cartoon. I'm like, well, this kind of is, if you really read the detective comics, I mean, it felt very much like that, but it was amazing to me. Cause I didn't think those kind of, those people kind of existed anymore. <laughs> I really didn't think people missed that, but apparently some people do. And I thought that was interesting. Yeah. I would say like, even as you like watch the movie, especially in the, in the opening sequences, you know, people riding on the train and walking around the city and, you know, almost like a, Tokyo Square or Times Square kind of feel there. It almost feels like this could be in the same world as um, the Joker with Joaquin Phoenix. It seems like it could be in that same element. It's not a it's not a stylized Gotham. It's not a you know flashy Metropolis Superman type thing. It, it felt like it was like downtown Chicago, and it was it was really really captivating from that perspective. It just felt like you lived in the world. Yeah, and I love the attention to realism in terms of there's so many things here that feel like, okay, so we're going for a more realistic version than even Nolan went for. You know what I mean? Cause I mean, his was pretty, pretty grounded in reality for the most part, but there were a lot of things where people just are really willing to accept a guy in a bat costume where here, you know, you, you have Zoe Kravitz's Catwoman. you know, she's got very much a made by a do it yourself costume. You know, it's not like something she went out and, had tailor made you have everyone that sees the batman in costume is really kind of freaked out by him a little bit or weirded out because they're it's not a normal thing to run across somebody in a giant bat costume it's odd and it's treated as such which feels more real the batmobile is very realistic muscle it's a muscle car with a jet engine on it which is <laughs> awesome yeah, I mean, it feels very much like this is the kind of car a filthy rich guy could put together, you know, in private and actually get get going. And I like that aspect of it. It's very real in terms of there's no Wayne Enterprises that is just, you know, coming up with gizmos and gadgets and basically making him James Bond in a cave. You know, a lot of the stuff he's doing himself. So there's a lot of that realism that Matt Reeves brought to this particular reboot that I think we haven't seen before and which is, it was nice. It was refreshing. Yeah. Even the tech that they used with the, uh, like the hearing, uh, devices and the, the contacts. Oh, the contacts was like, that was a cool addition. I mean, that yeah. was very cool. Seems like it all be very plausible today without, without a doubt. Oh, definitely. Google lens. <laughs> That's what happened to Google lens. He bought it out. I get it. I get it. I get it. And I did like how Matt Reeves, um, now every filmmaker has used this to a degree where they, they, infuse that fear is a weapon. You know, they, they kind of show that Batman uses fear to his advantage. I think they've shown that in pretty much every Batman movie, you know, Snyder did it a lot. You had, uh, Nolan did it quite a bit, you know, so it's, it's a prominent factor, but I liked how they did it here. It was a little bit different. There's a lot of use of the dark and shadows and the ominous focus of the dark Knight. You know, that, all that stuff that really, really kind of brings out the eerie vibe, the ominous vibe that I think is necessary for a, a real Batman horror story, which is what they were going for. There's a lot of shots in there, too, where they're actually like, like it looks through like the crack in the door or a crack in the window, or it's just that there's not like a full picture. So you're only seeing like a sliver of light through that yeah. specific spot, mm-hmm. almost to like symbolize that. You know, both the Riddler and the Batman are fractured people and they see the world in a fractured state and they're trying to put it back together the right way. Exactly. Now talk to me about the score by Michael oh, uh, Giacchino. Is it Giacchino or Giacchino? I don't know. G- I think it's Giacchino. Whichever it is. I've, I've heard it both ways. So, so why don't you tell me about the score? Because 
I was stoked that I felt like we finally have a Batman theme song that's hummable. And Danny Elfman's didn't do that for me. Really, no, 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 no. It was the last one that I could think of that really got me going. But here, this very slow, methodical, almost Jaws-like simplicity. Boom, 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 boom. I mean, it just, it was so exciting for me to have like a hummable Batman theme. What did you think about the score? And then taking that hummable Batman theme and like working it into different intonations of it as the sh- as the movie went along, like the I'm thinking the oh the gosh the chase scene on the freeway was like I thought was fantastic because it felt real. It felt like it didn't like we always say like the Matrix freeway scene is probably like one of the coolest freeway scenes out there in the original Matrix movie. I thought this Do was we really- always say that or does Troy always say that? Majority of people say that it's okay. a pretty, pretty a cool phenomenal, scene. you know, sequence until you get to tenant, and then you're like, well, the freeway scene tenant was really freaking great because of the whole driving backwards and like <laughs> yeah, jumping yeah. through, yeah. you know. But this was like classic chase scene on steroids. It was just so great. And then at every single time the Batmobile gets closer to the Penguin's car, you get that bum 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 bum. Mm-hmm. It's like, and it just got louder and louder and louder as the chase scene went. So it just like kept instilling fear into the penguin until you get this climactic finale of the chase scene. And it's just, and then just like bum 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 bum. It's like he does it like super fast at the end. I'm like, man, that's just brilliant. And then the the interweaving of uh, Ave Maria through the entire score, <laughs> like just where they sing it themselves or it's played as the actual song, or you actually hear the Ave Maria melody intertwined with the Batman theme at the same time. I think it's just freaking brilliant music in here that just set a tone that just chills down your spine the entire time. Except when the Riddler was singing it and I'm like, just stop. Just, Oh, that was a little bit weird. Yeah. yeah but. That, was a little, that was a little weird. I, I agree with everything you said about the music. I did not love the car chase. I really, there were so many close ups, man. Every, every single shot was just so close up and tight and it was hard to make out what was happening in several scenes until you get near the end of the chase where he's actually closing up on the Riddler and the tanker's going to explode and everything else from as soon as the tanker explodes up until he catches the penguin and he even walks slow to the damn car. He walks slow, literally, literally everywhere he goes. That was such a great shot, though, from the upside down. It's a great shot, but I'm just saying, like, the, the rest of the car chase was not, I don't think it was shot well. People keep saying they love this chase, so obviously I'm in the minority. I did not think it was shot well. It was so hard to follow and track what was happening. I did not I love think, it. I love the music, I think people, but I didn't love it. I think the, people just, like, forget about everything up until the ramp, because all you remember is the <laughs> ramp. And maybe it's maybe it's such a great i mean and i hate to talk about it because like i don't want to give it away but i know we're talking spoilers. we're spoilers talk but it's already spoiled man the riddler did it <laughs> there it's you go so it's so great he comes up the ramp and you know he's going to catch him right you just know he's going to catch him oh yeah but the penguin is the, the way they shoot it is like as if the camera was in the rear view mirror uh and then looking at the penguin you know towards the back so you could see the explosion behind the car and just the penguin's like, ah, ha, 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 right? That hubris laugh. <laughs> and then he just looks in the rear view mirror and goes, oh, F me. <laughs> As the Batmobile just boom, comes right out of the, Love the, that. The, the smoke and the fire and just lands and then sideswipes the penguin and the penguin flies through the air and flipping around and lands upside down. And it's just, it's just a gorgeous shot when Batman gets out of the car and just stands there in front of the fire and flames. Cape doom, drawn. Doom, doom, doom. It's beautiful. See, now it's humming in my head. It's never going to It's so away. great. You know, you brought up the penguin, so let's segue to the penguin. So you've got Colin Farrell. What is funny is that under all that makeup, you have Colin Farrell. And people that didn't know he was in the movie or saw his name, you know, on posters and whatnot, didn't know he was the penguin, are blown away to know that that is Colin Farrell. Now, granted, you could have found an actor that probably looked like that character, but I don't care. He was a great performance. It was the right choice. It worked wonders. And I was astonished at how much I could not recognize or even hear him. You know, I know Colin Farrell. I know I've seen most of his movies. There's nothing in there that came across as Colin Farrell to me. Yeah. And I think this is probably if you were to take, you know, cartoonish Danny DeVito, like out of the equation, right. From a, from a penguin perspective, Mm -hmm. 
if you were to have a real life looking penguin person, this is probably the best version of the penguin that we've seen because he's got the face has enough scarring on it that makes you go, yep, he's the penguin. I could tell you he's the penguin just by a quick glance. But then the fact that he actually has a gimp to add the waddle, I think that that was just a brilliant stroke of genius. And then <laughs> he's in the handcuffs and he's waddling yeah, away. He's waddled That's away. That's a nice little nod too. That's a great nod. I mean, I mean, it was just, yeah, everything about it is great. Cause it's like, it's, it's simplistic and real and not overhyped or over stylized to like make you think it's a comic book character because sometimes comic book characters can just be real people at the end of the day. I mean, if you're going to go for real realism, then yeah, that's what you need to do. The really real world to paraphrase the crow. I I was really impressed with the makeup and his performance. And I know he's getting an HBO max spinoff show where they're going to look at his rise to crime overlord or whatever. I'm kind of excited about that now where I wasn't before because I'm like, who needs a penguin show? Apparently, you know, they they had seen the, the full <laughs> scope of his performance. He's not even in the movie that much, but he leaves such a lasting impression. Yeah, he was actually a better bad guy character than the Riddler was, I think. Ooh, I can't wait to come to the Riddler then because I'd be interested to know exactly what you think. But we're going to hold him for a minute. Let's talk about Carmine Falcone. Other than the really, really cheesy, he's Selena's dad plot development, which I thought was pretty because lame. Because everybody has to be related. Yeah, that was pretty lame. But outside of that, John Turturro is a very versatile actor. He's been in a ton of, done of films. I mean, he's just, he's Coen Brothers' go-to. You know, he's just a great actor. What did you feel about what he brought to Carmine Falcone and the arc of that character and how involved he was with the Waynes and kind of shows Thomas Wayne to be a flawed man? Yeah, I mean that was the big thing for me was the the connection to the Waynes and how Thomas was not exactly above board. I mean, really at the end of the day, you need to think about the Arkham family and the Wayne family and their effect on Gotham and just that history. It really shows that maybe some of the stuff that's happening isn't actually bad because they're trying to actually fight for the people rather than fight for the rich. And I think that when it comes down to it, you know, Falcone's character for me I thought was like, yeah, crime boss. He kind of felt like the bad guy from Black Widow, um, Taskmaster, Mm -hmm. right? In a little, in a way, I I just felt like he didn't he didn't add a lot to the thing other than the uh, awesome, awesome pull to the face on his daughter. (laughs) I was like, whack! She like whacked it, like whacked her, and she just like dropped. (laughs) Like I was like, dude, that's like your daughter. You just like whacked her in the head. Mm -hmm. He didn't have that father instinct. No. And um, overall, I, I think the character was fine. I think the character served a purpose. I think it was, you know, his, he was, you know, driving the, the boys in blue and who, who they, they thought that he worked for and all of the, all of that, I think just works. But I mean, it's not like it was like, oh my gosh, I want a Falcone TV show. No, no. I mean, I was kind of, I think the character ran its course. Yeah. I, I like John Turturro a lot. Man, once they introduced that, you're Selena Kyle's dad. I'm like, oh my God. Are you and I kidding think that's me? what it was. It was like the minute that happened, it was like, really? Yep. You kind of lost me in the moment. And yep. there was one aspect to that whole plan, you know, where it's basically to cover up, uh, you know, Mrs. Wayne's mental health issues, which I didn't like that aspect. And I don't believe that's in the comics at all. I didn't like that at all. I just felt like, you know, it always amazes me what people are okay with people <laughs> changing comic lore as long as they like the director or they like the direction. Isn't that interesting? Like they're, they rage against it. If anybody changes anything, if it's not a filmmaker, they like, it's right. interesting. Interesting. But yeah, so I, I didn't like that angle. I just thought that was kind of, uh, but so Alfred, this is interesting. So Andy Serkis, fantastic actor. One of the best motion. Well, not one of the best motion capture artists that's, that's out there. Great director in his own right, too. He's really coming along. He did Jungle Book. He did the latest uh, Venom movie. I don't care what anyone said. That was fun. You know, he's he's a multi-talented guy. You got him in your Batman movie. And you give him, like, three scenes. Yeah, and it's not even the Alfred that we come to know where he's, like, the conscience or the... No, I still um, think he was a little bit that. I mean, at the end, he really kind of scolded Bruce. And at the beginning, he was telling him, you gotta, you, you gotta put on a show for these people. You gotta show... A different side you have to mingle you have to shake hands kiss babies all that stuff you have to have that 
if you want to do this at night. You know, I mean, I think you still had the Alfred, you know. Yeah, but it's very very background. Very background. Very background. Except for the pivotal scene. He doesn't even need to be in the movie. They could have just CGI'd him in. He was in it so very limited. (laughs) That's funny. Yeah, they could have CGI'd. They couldn't have CGI'd in that hand-holding moment, though. And that was very, very warm. That was good. That was very, very warm. Loved that moment. It was played beautifully. You know, because you were nervous, right? When the, when you like, he's like going through the thing. It's like, there's a bomb. There's a bomb. Please turn it over. There's a bomb. Please don't kill Alfred. There's a bomb. There's did a bomb. Th- there's a bomb. Did you think he could die? Because I really thought I'm like, you know what? They're going for a different approach here. Maybe he's going to try something different. You know, they killed Jimmy Olsen and fr- freaking Batman versus Superman. It could happen. Did you ever think he was actually in danger? No. The minute he threw the bomb away and then the way you see the explosion happen, yeah. you're like, he's going to be like scarred, but he's, he's be fine. Concussion, you know but not dead. If it would have been holding the bomb, different story. Oh yeah, for sure. All right. Selena Kyle, Zoe Kravitz. You know, I would say she's probably my biggest surprise. Not, not for any particular reason, but I've seen her in a bunch of stuff. And up until Kimmy, which is on HBO max and came out recently, I hadn't seen her do anything that I felt was much of a stretch. I felt kind of, kind of by the numbers role. So maybe that's just what she was being cast in. I thought she was actually pretty fantastic. I mean, she's just shy of Michelle Pfeiffer on the Catwoman scale for me now. But is it okay to mention she's not wearing the Catwoman suit? Say that again. You know, when she goes to the club and she's got that walk to her, and she just she just feels like she commands the room, and she's got like the was the pink wig. Oh, definitely contacts. She takes control. I yeah. mean, all eyes are on her. I mean, even when the cameras, even when she's in a, in a scene, even when the cameras rolling around the scene, if Batman's done it. Your eyes are looking for her because, and not because she's just attractive, which she is. It's, I think she really, really held the screen. She had a captivating performance and she had charisma just rolling off her little arms. I mean, like, like I saw Big Little Lies and watching her here as Selena, it's not even the same actress to me. Like, like that's Zoe Kravitz. It doesn't look like Zoe Kravitz. And of course it must be the hair. And the fact that, you know, she has a much shorter haircut for this role, but it just, it didn't even seem like it was Zoe Kravitz. Cause it's like on a whole different acting level at this point. Yeah. I mean, she's really great in everything she does, but this like was another level for her. And I think it was really interesting to see how she played the, you know, vengeful daughter card to I'm going to kick your ass card in general versus the, you know, don't look at me and touch me in the club kind of, you know, angle. Like she just comes in that, but then she has those, sweet tender moments with the Batman at the same time. So it's not like she was like this scorned Catwoman that Michelle Pfeiffer played, but a much more, again, real character. Like you would see this person in any club in downtown. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. She just happens to live with a lot of cats. That's all. And honestly, I mean, she, she's going on the talk show circuit and she keeps saying like, she, I, I drink milk out of a bowl to practice for the role. I'm like, I don't understand that. That's a weird thing to do because you're not an actual cat and you drink milk out of a glass but whatever but there Um, there's we all have drinking milk out of a bowl it's called cereal it happens (laughs) never lapped it up i don't recall ever lapping my cereal never done that what i really felt strongly about is there aren't too many of the cat women that have made the character kind of their own they've always felt like i'm playing cat woman I don't know I'm, if that really I'm makes sense. I'm playing somebody in a black leather suit. Yeah, thank you. I mean, even ha- Anne Hathaway, who I thought did a fine job. You know, I never really felt like her character was as fully fledged as she could have been. She got better as it went on. Uh, I obviously Holly Berry was she's she's a fine actress, just a really really bad Catwoman. Sorry, it's the writing, mm-hmm. whatever it was, it's just not good. But Michelle Pfeiffer, I mean, I think she really really brought it, and. I'm just talking the movies. I'm not talking Eartha Kit and all that stuff. Right. But Zoe Kravitz, for whatever reason, maybe it's because I, ha- I had low expectations because I hadn't seen much of her work where I was really uh, astounded. But man, I, I just, I felt like she really created a fully fledged character. She gave her a lot of depth. She didn't have a ton of screen time. She has a lot of chemistry with Robert Pattinson. I mean, there's some palpable sexual tension there. Tension. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah. ev- every scene they were in, you know, a lot of times you see this, you just feel like, well, Batman just kind of likes that she's in a leather outfit. I felt like he was extremely attracted to her. Every time they were close, I was waiting for them to make out because I just felt like they, the power was there. And that, that's that's palpable. That's tangible. I really, really love that aspect of it. And she's just 
she really impressed me. Like I'm really looking forward to what she does next. My only criticism is I thought it was really creepy when Batman's like lingering across the way, spying on her. as She changes clothes. That was weird. Hey, you know, he's a younger Bruce Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and obviously the Falcons are dead. Yeah. 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 That's not her I mean, fault. I mean, it was so good. She, she could carry her own film. Like they could do oh, a, for sure. Yeah. You know, another, you know, movie after this and be just about her and, Batman maybe comes in the last frame of the movie or something because he's been tracking her down or whatever. But yeah, she could totally hold her own movie with this character now. And when she can, when she's in the, the iceberg lounge, right. Mm -hmm. And she's undercover and she's wearing the contacts and everything else. And she realizes that Bruce is just using her and she kind of just, you know what? I'm going my own way. I, I care about who killed my friend. That's all I care about. I believed her in that moment. I didn't feel like it was some forced setup that was required for the script. You know, it felt like that's what that character, because she had made her a full character. That's what that character would do in that moment. And I love that. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about your favorite character, the Riddler, who apparently isn't as good as the penguin. Well, I mean, Just letting you know. the problem, the problem with the Riddler for me is that I've never really liked the Riddler. I like the riddles. I like the puzzles, but the concept of the Riddler himself I just never really bought into. And maybe it's mm. because the Jim Carrey version is like burning your brain because oh it's God. so bad God. that it's just comical. But Paul Dano does a really great job with this particular version of the Riddler because you don't even know, like I think you had to be a comic book fan to in this opening sequence of the movie to know who he actually is. Cause I'm like, well, is he like a Sandman? Is he like Bane? Oh, like, you didn't know. Going? You didn't know. I mean, I know that the movie was about the Riddler, right? But oh, I didn't but you know didn't. That he, I get what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know that he was playing the Riddler. And I'm like, because I haven't seen the Riddler look like this, where he's wearing basically like saran wrap and goggles and duct tape. And like, it's like a I love that you costume. said the Sandman. Like, that's from Batman. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Like, I think we know you don't read the comics. I don't read the comics. So I was like, I didn't know. I honestly didn't know who this was. And then once like it finally like the murder happens and you get the, oh, okay, he's, he's the Riddler. Got it. Okay, fine. Um, and, and maybe it was just because it was the, like he acts it really well, right? I'm not saying that Paul Dano did a bad job. He like the, the voice inflections and the, and the screeching and then the laughing and the, like all of it is just what you would see a deranged bad guy to be who had some, you know, issues growing up as a kid. And I think the the challenge for me was like all of the shaky cam web video, which was very realistic and fit the tone of the movie. It was just so off putting sometimes that it was just like, it could have been anybody and it's just Paul Dano's voice. Right. Because you never see his mouth move. You never, it's just this like, yeah, it's behind the on, mask. Yep. Yeah. It's just his mask on a camera and it's all like the camera's moving and shaking and stuff. And it's like, come on, like, just let me see Paul Dano. And so when you finally see Paul Dano at the end of the movie, then it's like, oh, he's really good, except for the singing part. Yeah, it's Paul Dano, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> but I want to get a correction until we get to the end. I, That's just because it was a detective story, and I was thinking, book him, Dano. <laughs> sure you go. There you go. I like that better. I thought he was a very, very good – He's a he's a – very talented actor and prisoners, yes. man. He was so good in prisoners. If you've never seen prisoners, definitely check that out. What I thought was interesting about his Riddler was yeah, it's very much in the same vein. It's going to sound like a weird comparison, but very similar to Aquaman. Aquaman is a character I never gave a crap about because I thought it was just a joke. It was just, I just never was feel felt threatened by him. Never felt really, uh, impressed by his character. I just, I thought he was the lamest superhero in the world. Then you're you like, put, like, Ooh, I'm going to die for a little mermaid's boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Then you put Jason Momoa in it. Suddenly you got a character I'm interested in because he kind of made his, the character his own. He kind of put his own spin on it. And that's what Dano does here. He really, I mean, there's some things that he does that are weird because apparently he shrink wrapped his head for the part mm -hmm. in plastic. That's just odd. I, that's a little too method. Why are people on this movie doing weird method stuff? I don't know, but that's what they're doing. I'm I'm sure Pattinson probably lived with some bats or something <laughs> at some point, whatever. But for whatever reason, whatever he did to make it work, he really felt like a maniacal villain. He really created a character that I was actually 
in fear of for our lead. You know, I was actually worried could hurt Alfred or uh, Selena or Batman. You know, I really felt like he was so off his rocker and, you know, he would seem like he's so in control with these clever puzzles and these clever little setups, but then he lost his mind a couple times and you could just see the rage and the, the completely lost mindset that exists within his head. And I think that, that performance really, really worked wonders for me. Uh, the only thing that, about the Riddler that made me laugh was you have 500 followers and you got like at least 20 guys with sniper rifles to show up. That feels that numbers skewed. Yeah. Cause you know, they have to travel, you know, <laughs> might be a couple of people who were, were abroad at the time out of the 500. Yeah. Right. You know, and I, I think the problem is, is that it reminded like watching the performance, it reminded me too much of Phoenix's Joker. Like it felt the same. So it was like hard to go like, a little is bit. this the Riddler or is this the Joker? A little bit. You know, I could see that. And I will say the video that you're talking about kind of almost felt ripped off from Dark Knight, didn't it? Yeah. Heath Ledger did that exact same thing and was very crazy maniacal. That, well, the, everybody kept raving whole, about that. What a quite, that's an intense scene. I'm like, I've seen it before. The interrogation scene, I've seen it before. I mean, those were not new things to me. Yeah, the, um, the whole, oh, last twist, by the way, FYI, all these bombs around the city that are going to break the seawall felt very much Dark Knight as well. Yeah, Dark Knight Rises right there. Yeah. Yep. So, but we, we can't say that because apparently, no, it's all new. <laughs> it's all new. I'm like, not really. Not really. At least Batman won in that one. <laughs> yeah. Just, just saying he got the bomb out of there. Whatever. But, you know, I, I do like he comes across very psychotic and it works. He's always one step ahead of Batman. That was interesting because he's the world's greatest detective and Batman literally never gets ahead of him in the movie. Do you notice that? Ever. Yeah. He, actually, Batman doesn't beat him at any step of the way because it's very much like seven where John Doe just turned himself in. You know, he just got caught. He got himself caught. Yeah. In the, you know, James Dean at the diner, LA confidential mm -hmm. total ripoff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's so, busted in. That was, that was kind of funny. I'm like, so you got a Batman movie where Batman really doesn't, do much except you know Pull lead people out like moses on the you know <laughs> to the sea i mean anyway we'll come to batman here shortly but that, but that was a cool thing right like speaking of the carpet the fact that the uh, the initial murder weapon in the entire thing ends up being the thing that unveils the big plan at the end yeah i, I like that. that was a really cool like oh hey here we go full circle there's a lot of clever pieces at play for sure yeah. and i did love even though it was kind of reminiscent, but I love the Arkham moment between Batman and Riddler where, where Bats Pats or whatever we want to call him thinks Riddler knows he's Bruce Wayne. By the way, I mean, he's talking to him. Yeah. The way he's talking to him. Oh my yeah. God. That was an, in, that was actually really intense. That worked for me. I'm like, he's going to get found out in this movie. I had no idea they were going to pull an Iron Man here where suddenly his identity is out there, but he doesn't. That was extremely well, uh, timed written and shot because it yeah. worked perfectly it was creepy like you just felt it like tingles up your spine bruce way it's like yeah. oh my gosh that was so so good and i do love the moment where batman rejects him because he's a loon and he's just like you're insane he's beating on the glass and everything else as if he's totally forgot shaking yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally forgets that he's wearing a giant bat costume you're both nuts <laughs> it's okay all right commissioner gordon James slash Jim Gordon. Jeffrey Wright is one of my favorite actors. You and I do a whole podcast on Westworld. We love Jeffrey Wright. We love Beyond Westworld, by the way, if you want to check it out. Even even in season two. <laughs> even in season two. And I, I still always say Peoples Hernandez is one of my favorite film characters. If you've never seen Shaft, he is just stellar in that movie. But well, how did you feel he delivered as Commissioner Gordon? Right down the line. Never questioned it for a second. I mean, he's not the the goofy, jovial, you know, larger than life kind of, you know, Chief Gordon or um, Commissioner Gordon. But he just the, his relationship with the Batman is established fairly early on as if they were friends the entire time. Like you didn't need the backstory of how did they meet? How did they get together? Like you just assume like, oh, this is Commissioner Gordon. And you just pick up like they've been old chums forever. And then the jokes between the two of them, I think, really solidified that friendship between the two of them and just the, the back and forth that they have. It was it was really well done. I mean, and 
is Jeffrey Wright. I mean, come on. Like, you can't say anything bad about the man. He is just acting gold. You know what's cool is my son, years ago, said, uh, it's probably, I don't know, three, four years ago, whatever. It was before he was cast in this. Said he would love it if Jeffrey Wright was Commissioner Gordon someday. Weird coincidence. But now that I've seen it, I'm totally I'm totally on board. I mean, he's an actor. Can't I don't see it. Yeah. yeah. Can't unsee it. No, absolutely. And Gary Oldman was fantastic for those movies. But this really kind of feels like a different Gordon. I just... I just really, really love the, almost like the buddy cop relationship he has with Batman throughout most of the movie. Like it really felt like they teamed up. Isn't that what he says one of those lines? It's like, what is this bad cop, bad shit cop? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Just so good. And he keeps calling him man. He always refers to him as man. Hey man. Yeah. It's almost like a term of endearment to, to a certain degree. You know, I, the only thing that I would say is I can't for the life of me understand how this cop he's a very good cop right you would think he has deductive skills of some sort robert pattinson doesn't really play bruce wayne any different from batman and he literally was talking to batman like five minutes before that church scene then he goes and he sees bruce wayne he kind of has a minor conversation with him he sounds exactly the same i don't know how he doesn't recognize that he's you know batman he looks the same because he still has the black shoe yes. polish on his eyes yes there's, if you're a good cop, you should have figured this out. Hey guys, anybody got any black construction paper? I want to put it over his head a little bit and just see if, uh, yeah, same guy. I got it. You know, it just, what? <laughs> <laughs> that part drove me nuts. But the thumb drive joke makes up for it. Oh, the thumb drive joke was great. <laughs> so thumb drive. Oh, speaking of, let's segue to Pattinson. Mr. Pattinson as Bruce Wayne. We're going to do Bruce Wayne first. Okay, so I get he's in year two of being Batman. He's newly adopting, but he's also been Bruce Wayne his whole life, right? And his parents died when he was a kid. So even though I know a lot of people keep giving me the excuse, well, that's why, you know, he isn't trying very hard to be the billionaire playboy. It's because he's in year two of being Batman and, you know, it's still a struggle. I think that's a lame excuse. I do not accept it. It's a lame excuse. He's been Bruce Wayne since he was a kid. He's, he's... uh, you're trying to tell me that he doesn't understand duality is necessary when he's intentionally covering his face with a mask to protect his identity. I just think that is a lame argument. He should have played Bruce Wayne a little different. I think he doesn't look like Bruce Wayne. That's the problem. I think the problem with oh, the haircut Pattinson's Bruce Wayne is that Bruce Wayne. I always feel is like businessman, you know, mid forties kind of hunky, sexy Pattinson is, you know, goth emo alternative punk. Like he's he trying out for com- Fallout Boy. Yeah, he does. He does not command the business world in this movie. That is not the Bruce Wayne you get here. He's not a titan of industry. He's not following in his father's footsteps. And maybe that's part of what it was supposed to be because we know that Thomas had flaws. So this is him trying to be different than his dad in, in a lot of ways. Well, apparently he didn't even know there were flaws until till the end of the movie. Like, I'm so surprised. I thought my daddy and mommy were heroes. Oh <laughs> goodness. Well, that's just one. I just don't accept that as an excuse. People keep telling me that. And I'm like, no, I do not accept that. He was Bruce Wayne as a kid. He had years and years and years of Alfred training him to fight and everything else. And explaining that the duality is important. He wears a mask to protect his identity. So he obviously knows duality is important. And yet he's completely oblivious to the fact that he has to have a dual personality. I just don't buy that. I just think they were more focused on Batman, which is fine. Bruce Wayne's really not a primary character here. It's all Batman almost right. all the time. He only shows up a couple of times in the entire movie. Right. But I do think there should have been more of an indication that he was at least trying to be the Batman that Alfred said that he needed to be because he had more than enough time to practice and to, to build that, you know, unless he's completely psychotic. Is that what we're saying? Like Batman's completely psychotic because that's not a hero I want to get behind. But at the same time, when you think about, you know, how the Riddler and the Batman together, like how their relationship is and the origin story between the two of them, Mm -hmm. I think there's a very good possibility that the Batman just is as flawed as the Riddler was. It's just you have um, station in life in order to understand the good versus the bad enough, but at the same time, Push me far enough and he could break just as easily as the Riddler could sure. or the Joker could. Sure. Okay. Well, Robert Pattinson as Batman. Here's what I'll say. He's a great Batman. He's great. The The tools were good. The movement was good. Um, that The hanging 
all the hanging from things with one hand, you know, definitely was good. I loved the uh, the Batman can fly. What? Oh, his wingsuit. Like, his wingsuit. That was so freaking cool. Oh, I loved how he hit the ground, man. Like you could tell he hadn't practiced this very much. <laughs> like right. that felt like year two. Oh, I have this cool tool. Ow! I don't know how to use it. Um, but overall, yeah, I think he did a really great job, even when he's in the mask and having those quiet moments with Selena or just interrogating people or talking to Gordon, like all of it just felt, it felt like bad. Like you're not looking at it and going like, oh my gosh, he doesn't have the physique of Affleck or the physique of Bale. Uh, it just, it just, you just, you put on the mask and it like every Batman looks the same. I didn't love the suit in this one. I really don't like the look of the cowl. I just, I don't like the, how the nose looks that the cape doesn't look great, but I still think Pattinson crushed it as Batman. I was actually really, really, I, I knew he would do well because I don't, I always thought he was a very good actor. I don't hold twilight against him. The guy's done a lot of work since then. Now we know what a vampire does when they turn into a bat. They, you know, mm-hmm. exact vengeance, but there's a lot of shots throughout the film where he says nothing. So the entirety of the performance is held in his eyes, by the way, Kudos Which are covered to, by a mask. Yeah, kudos to the uh, the eye makeup, whoever yeah. whoever did the eye makeup, because the eye makeup is stellar. But he commands the entire scene and shows you what he's thinking with just his eyes, and that's very impressive because it's very hard to do if you're not a very talented actor. He's extremely talented because there are ex- excessively several scenes where the entirety of the scene is dictated by his look. His his visual representation, he's not talking to anybody. He's just looking around. He's assessing the room. He's assessing the crime scene, whatever he's doing. And it's all in his eyes. And I, I am so impressed with how he delivered that, that I walked out of there more impressed with him as a performer than I already was. And I already thought he was a really good actor. Yeah, he was great in uh, Devil All the Time. He was oh, great yeah. in um, Tenant. Like there's just, yeah, it, it, this is like, oh, he's got some range. A ton ton of range kind of like kind of like everybody was saying about kristen stewart same thing like who knew she's not i'll keep her a little lower on that scale (laughs) but you know he there are little moments that that really even took him even further he played every entry to that iceberg lounge (laughs) completely different you know it was very different it was batman it was batman vengeance batman it was a different batman it was bruce wayne shows up that one time bruce wayne just absolutely crushed i mean he's playing every single time he's at that which became quite a fun little gag to see how how's he gonna handle this situation but he played it different every time it was a beautiful aspect that really showed his flexibility in in my opinion the the scene where he walks in into the very initial murder investigation where he's walking through the room with the cops the only slow walk that I'm okay with <laughs> as he's walking into that room and all his cops are looking at him almost with disdain. Would you agree? Disdain. Yeah. Dis- they, they don't want him there. He's a freak. That's how they yeah. see him. He shouldn't yeah. be touching anything. Chain of evidence. Yeah, exactly. You know, he's wearing gloves. It's true. It's true. Um, he, he goes to that room. He glides to that room. He's very, very slow and he's assessing every situation, every person. And he does a really, really good job of using his eyes to, to just, demonstrate how uncomfortable he is because his whole goal here was to never face he wanted to be in the shadows right he didn't want to be here right. at a murder scene and here he is among cops the the one group that's been looking for him he doesn't want to be here and everything with his eyes demonstrates that and it also shows in my mind that he's keeping uh, kind of a tally of where things are and how to get out of the situation should it go south yeah, I think in the expressive nature, too, when you go to the same kind of concept when he's in the Riddler's apartment by himself and the one cop says, hey, you can't be in here. And he just kind of gives him that that look and he kind of backs off like the villains all backed off in the opening sequences of the movie. Mm-hmm. I thought that was really cool, too. Like this cop is actually scared of the Batman. Oh, yeah, definitely. I like his fighting style. It's very Arkham Asylum, I would say, mm-hmm. especially when he's stringing people upside down. <laughs> it was just great. And by the end, you know, he figures out that even though I wish he would have kind of solved something and actually got ahead of the Riddler, maybe stopped the explosions or something else, you know, I, that kind of bugged me because the Batman didn't really beat the Riddler at all. But at the end, you know, this entire movie, he realizes that the criminals are, are doing the same thing he's doing. Like he's out for vengeance. He's just out for himself. And it's really not helping the city the way that he thought it would. 
he needs to be a, a symbol of hope for the people that are being beaten, that are being criminalized and victimized. And what you get is he like walks across the water with the oh, flare that, gun that to like go rescue everybody from beautiful the, Moses shot where yeah. he, the flare and he's leading his people out of there. That is a beautiful, beautiful shot. Beautiful. Really shot. good. Really yeah. Good. And then at the, at the end, he becomes this beacon of hope. Like the entire movie, his whole journey has been leading to him realizing I have to be more than just vengeance. I need to, because you know, when he hears another criminal say the same thing, I'm vengeance. Oh man, that's what I, that's my game. You know, he realizes he has to be this beacon of hope and he has to save these people and give them a reason to, to, to believe in him, you know, to really mm -hmm. be a hero. It's really kind of a hero's journey by the end. It is. Love that. So any other highlights or issues that we haven't already talked about? Anything that really impressed you? Do you want to mention that Joker cameo? Yes, it is. Well, we should Joker. talk about the Joker cameo, but before we get there, did you feel like the fight sequences because of how slow he walks in the room and how like methodical <laughs> so most of the slow. movie was, did you feel like the fight sequences were like artificially sped up? Cause it felt like it was like, you know, like it almost looked like that was like, they sped up the film a little bit. I don't make it look more entertaining. I don't think they sped the film up. I think you just had, you've had characters for, you know, three straight hours that are just kind of walking very slow. They really are like every character, nobody even trots, you know, I guess Catwoman's about the fastest we see move when they're not in action. So I think when you see a fight scene, it's just the, the break from what we're used to. I don't think they sped anything up that I saw. I don't know. I just thought that one Selena fight towards the end, it just felt like, cause she's so small compared to everybody else. Mm -hmm. That was just like it, it, her, her body movement was like, wow, that was so fast. <laughs> That's kind of like they had to have like sped this up or something just to make the effect look better. Well, one fight scene I thought was amazing, which we haven't talked about, is that hallway scene where Batman comes out of the elevator. It's complete darkness. And the the entirety of the light is uh, handled by muzzle flashes. And Oh, yeah. That was a really great sequence. Matt Reeves did something very similar to that. And I think it was War of the Planet of the Apes. It's a very sm short scene. But he did something similar. But I really love how that was shot. I mean, it was just for, for various reasons. You you're getting one Batman is, is a creature of the night. You know, he's basically, he's hunting in the dark. He's got those contacts so he can see in the dark. He can see where his victims are. You know, they're just shooting randomly. You know, sometimes they hit him, sometimes they don't, but thankfully he's got the bat suit on. And we are actually kind of trapped in there with them because we have tons of darkness. The only time we see any illumination is when a muzzle flash goes off. It's just, honestly, I think that might go down as just one of the best shot fight scenes. Agree. Agree. So good. All right. So, so yes, let's talk about Barry. Barry, Barry Keegan. Keegan. Mm -hmm. Barry As Keegan. the Joker confirmed by Matt Reeves in an interview, mm -hmm. uh, even though it was pretty obvious when he was like, Oh, and then they just treat you like you're a clown. <laughs> it's like, okay, we know who that is. Yeah. And then the laugh. I wasn't a fan of the laugh. I think he needs to work on that a little bit. Yeah. Um, um I, I, th I think the disappointing thing, well, I mean, two things are, are here with Barry's character. One, that they actually filmed scenes with Barry as cop Steve. So it was actually part of the police force. And so they were doing that to like throw off the fact that the Joker was in the movie. Trying to trick and us. So, trying to trick us. Uh, but there was a second sequence that was cut from the movie because it was going to be more of like a mind hunter thing. Like how do I get in the mind of the Riddler? Because the Riddler's one step ahead of me mm. and Batman was supposed to come to Arkham and actually interrogate the Joker and get information from the Joker, how to think like a criminal, how to be a criminal. Um, Matt eventually did cut that from the movie. Hopefully we get it as like a deleted scene on the, on the extras, but um, that would have been cool. But I, I like that the fact that it was cut out and you didn't see him till the end because it's like, enough to make you go will there be another movie will the joker be involved or will there be another movie and these two people are going to be like not even in the movie because they're trapped in arkham asylum but it just it just left enough a nerveness at the end especially when they were laughing with each other at the same time like like what's the answer to the riddle a friend and it was like ee! and i was like oh that was so creepy yeah it was it was good i don't need the joker yet you know, but if you can, if you can just wash away the memory of Jared Leto, that would be fine. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever you can do to make that go away, I would be just uh, eternally grateful because my God, that was horrible. 
Uh. And we don't know yet if Barry Ke- Keegan can actually pull it off. Like when you see Barry Keegan fully fleshed out. Yeah. You got to see him in the makeup. You got to see what he's going to, are you going to do something different? I mean, we've had three iconic jokers. Two of them won Oscars for their performances. You know, you've got Jack Nicholson, you've got Heath Ledger and you've got Joaquin Phoenix. What are you going to do different? What are you going to do to separate yourself? Do we, right. are we even ready for that? Cause we just had that Joker movie not too long ago. I mean, Correct. me personally, I would rather see the court of owls as a, as a really fun Batman story. I would love to see that rather than another Joker story. I just don't, I would rather have like a tease, another end of movie tease or maybe mid movie tease in the second film. And then the third movie goes to the Joker rather than a Joker movie already. Correct. All right. Well, correct. Then I'm right. <laughs> I like it. Court of Owls. We talked about Court of Owls, I think, one time before on the podcast. Like, they need to do Court of Owls. Yeah, absolutely. It would be fantastic. I, I mean, we did remake this movie right. We talked about Batman. Court of Owls is the story we wanted to tell then. It's just, it's so very much a story, I think, worth telling. Agree. I really, really do. Anything else on Matt Reeves' The Batman? Uh, go see it. Oh, definitely. Multiple times so that it can beat Spider-Man. <laughs> Come on now. Come on, son. I ain't gonna do it. You know why? Spider-Man's more important. Unless they suddenly throw out a cut with Ben Affleck and Michael Keaton and all these other guys showing up. Adam West shows up in his pajamas. Whatever else. Then maybe. 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 Then you can get people excited. No, but it's good. It's really good. And I think it's the kick in the pants DC needed. Not gonna it's, ask- a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a full year of DC this year. The Flash and Aquaman 2 and... Black Adam. Black, Black Adam's, Adam's coming. coming. Yeah. Can I ask you, as someone who is a not a comic book fan, I mean, you like the Marvel movies. I would movies. say I'm not a comic book fan. I just, You're not a fan I, of comic books to where you read I don't them. read comic books. Yeah, you don't read them. Yeah. Because, I mean, you see all these movies. What, for you, is different about this one than the other ones? I don't think, to me, this one feels very much like Nolan's Batman's, which is why I think it's really good. Because that's your, your favorite kind of style. That's my favorite kind of Batman. Yeah. The dark, gritty, noir. I don't like the... I mean, I liked Adam West when I was a kid because it's like, ah, it's a kid. It's funny. Ha ha. You know, but when you're an adult, you're like, I want I want, the, I want, the dark. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm, I'm similar. I really preferred Ben Affleck's. I, I would have loved to see the one that he wrote that we'll never get to see. I just really feel like Ben Affleck is a great director and a great writer. I would have loved to have seen the movie that he made. I think it would have crushed it at the box office just like this one. He just never got a solo Batman movie. I'd be interested to see what he would have been like just being the Batman in this movie. Oh, man. I think it would have been great. It would have been weird having him play year two, but <laughs> would have to do a lot of that Marvel uh, de-aging makeup. That's for sure. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. So what, what do you want to see in the next The Batman? If they make another one, what do you want to see? Is there anything you want them to do? I mean, I always like the Two-Face character, so if they can do something with Two-Face, that would be fine. I'm not really a big villain fan of the Batman universe, though. I like Batman, so it's like, maybe give me a new villain I've never seen before. Give me a new story I've never heard of before. I wonder if fans would be okay. Or just do the Court of Owls, damn it. (laughs) Do you think fans would be okay if they actually created a whole new villain for the cinematic universe, I guess? Well, I mean, are you talking about the fans, or are you talking about the super fans? You know, not the super, the super fans, fans. They will not be okay they, they like veto it right away. It's like that's not in the comic book. Screw that! I'm not watching that movie. Mm-hmm. I don't know. They're all on board villain. with Matt Reeves. I've heard so much hyperbole that this is the best Batman movie ever. I'm like, easy, 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 <laughs> easy. I've seen The Dark Knight like a hundred times, and it doesn't stop being as great as it is. Let's relax. Yeah, let's get let's get Reeves to get three in, and then we'll compare Reeves and Nolan in a battle royale or something. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, The Dark Knight, all those times I've seen it, never once did I feel like checking my watch. I did check my watch here several times. Oh, yeah. Several times. Especially in the end, because it kind of started to feel like, you know, Fellowship of the Ring. It was like, is this where it ends? Is it over now? <laughs> nope. There's a motorcycle chase. They've been walking a very long time. This is a very is long walk. Ends? Oh, no. We got to go back to Arkham Asylum again. Is this where it ends? <laughs> Oh, by the way, they said that the, they were going to do a Gotham City PD show for HBO Max, and that's been shelved, and now they're going to make an Arkham Asylum show, which I'm, I'm okay more with an Arkham Asylum show because we already had a Gotham show. It was yeah. on Fox. We yeah. don't need it, another Gotham show. Exactly. All right. Well, thanks for joining me for this conversation, Troy. Man, I really appreciate you doing it. Absolutely. Glad I was able to watch the Batman not 24 hours ago. <laughs> and Amanda never made it. 
So I don't know what happened to her. I guess she's probably in a showing of the Batman seeing it again. Oh, what if she's buried under a carpet? Oh, easy. That's dude. That's dark. That's just so dark. <laughs> All right. Remember, you can always find more information at the Hollywood Outsider.com. We're on Facebook, the Hollywood Outsider, or on Twitter at buy popcorn, where our Patreon is patreon.com slash the Hollywood Outsider. You can hear Troy and I all the time on the Blacklist Exposed and Beyond Westworld podcasts as well, which uh, we're coming back for Westworld, I believe, in the summer. Summer. Yep, yep. And remember, the next time you head to a theater to see the Batman by popcorn. Because you have to go to the theater to see it. Yes. Or wait till April 19th, I believe, <laughs> for HBO Max, if you want to wait that long. But if you do, I'm going to spoil the shit out of it. I think we already did. I'm already spoiled the shit out of it. Okay, now I'm going to segue to revisit a conversation that we recently had with myself, Amanda Sink, and Brian Williams on vigilantes and why we love them. Take a listen. Okay, well, now we're going to move on to our From the Outside In topic. Man, this is about vigilantes. Yeah, I said vigilantes. I don't know why I said that, but vigilantes. (laughs) So let's define what a vigilante is first, because some people do confuse vigilante with assassin, which I guess is fair. That's a that's a fair comparison. Mm -hmm. Any person who takes the law into his or her own hands as by avenging a crime. That's the actual definition of vigilante. So when you mention the word, few names immediately pop into mind. Batman, like we talked about, The Bride, Paul Kersey from the Death Wish movies. I'm talking about the real mm-hmm. Death Wish movies, not the recent garbage. <laughs> uh, Equalizer, obviously. Film vaults are film vaults are stock full of men and women who have been wrong for one reason or another and chose to journey outside of the law to avenge those wrongs, to right them, so to speak. Yet, in the scheme of things, the facts are simple. These people are criminals. They are breaking the law. They are doing something illegal. So we're going to just discuss why we love criminals like these and where we stand on their brand of justice. So first up, do you believe... Vigilantes are fundamentally justified. I mean, generally, yeah. That and, and we're talking movie vigilantes. Obviously, we don't necessarily mean <laughs> the real people. We're on not the condoning you, you know, to go out there and don't conduct hurt criminal anyone crimes. unless they do something really bad. Don't hurt anyone. It's bad for you. So, Amanda, what do you think? Are they fundamentally justified in movies? Yeah, I mean, generally, typically, a, vig- a vigilante is doing their thing, and the reason they're doing their thing is because the government is corrupt or perpetually not doing what they should be doing. So, the vigilante feels like they need to step in; that they have a they have the ability to take care of something, so they feel an obligation to do so. But they aren't doing those things to benefit themselves; they're doing it for others. And so, for me, that's what makes it in a film justifiable is because they're not doing it for selfish reasons. They're doing it... Well, they're kind of doing it for selfish reasons. The majority of them are doing... I mean, I shouldn't say majority. A lot of times it's... They see the they see the benefit. Even if it was because they were wronged, sometimes it's because they don't want anyone else to be wronged the way they were. So for me, that makes it more justifiable. When it's just a selfish reason, like I'm going to get back at you because my ego is hurt, then it's kind of slanted from there. But I mean, what about you guys? Am I alone in that thought? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I separate them from the revenge seekers, the assassins, the mercenaries, people that are that see a bigger problem. And, and again, they the it's not a this person killed my parents type of thing or my wife. This is just this neighborhood needs to be cleaned up and the police are too scared to do something. Somebody's got to fix this. I got skills. I'll take care of it. So I'm fine with it. You you have to have rules whenever you're doing it. You have to have a code or uh, there must be a, a line that you will not cross. Yeah. So what about once you cross that line, it gets easier to justify pushing that line further and further back. So what about in circumstances like, say, Paul Kersey from Death Wish? And I know a lot of people haven't seen those movies because they're, they're pretty old. But he goes after gang members. I originally started with his wife being victimized, and then he goes after gang members after that. So they're not all savage murderers. Not everybody in a gang is a savage murderer, but they a lot of them find themselves just as dead. Are you are you okay with the casualties when this happens in, in movies? Because, hey, hey, you were part of that action. It's kind of on you, man. Or, or do you feel like, man, that's where you went to – or is that the line you were talking about? Well, I it- – it all, I mean, it really depends on the character and, and everything. So 
but the, I mean, the other side of that coin is, is if this person is in the same gang that did some wrongs or, or that's terrorizing the neighborhood, sure. They might not have committed a specific act that was witnessed, but you know what? You're wearing their, their colors or their, their patches or whatever the case is. You're part of them. You're, you know, you got some bad timing because I just walked down your alley. If you didn't do anything to stop it or prevent it, that aren't you innately part of that? Aren't you? But are you, but are you just as guilty? I mean, of, of murder, if you – maybe you're afraid of being killed. You know, you, there are gang members, I'm sure, that people that join because of circumstance and whatnot. I feel like you can feel I don't think you. I don't think you – I mean, as a, as a, as a vigilante that is – that is cleaning cleaning house, whether it's a neighborhood or a full city or a state or whatever, you're not asking them, you know, you're not interviewing, you're not, you're not, <laughs> you're not, <laughs> not, you're not triaging process. the different bad guys. You're, you're a bad guy. You, for whatever reasons, again, your affiliation, just by looking at you, I can tell you are affiliated with a certain crime syndicate and you need to be you need to be removed from the system now. You know if the person's begging for mercy or or, or saying they'll they'll leave town or something, and you still kill them. I, you know, sure that's probably one of those lines that that shouldn't be crossed. But if you're if you're associated with the bad the quote unquote bad guys in a movie, that's that's part of the the risk you take. I was going to say that kind of goes with the gig. I mean, you yeah. have to, if you're in a... If there's a vigilante coming after your gang, well, I guess I'm dead. That's, I that's, mean, or the police, like, just because you... throw your colors at them? Just because you weren't the one who murdered someone doesn't mean the police aren't going to arrest you for having your affiliation with them. So at what point does it, is it any different when a vigilante is the one who's coming after them? And you don't necessarily have to kill all of them, you know? Just maim a few. If he's just, <laughs> all right, hey, this guy, you know what, he's, 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 for whatever reason, I think I can, I can get information out of this guy. I'll, I might break a finger. <laughs> I might, you know, light the hairs on his, you know, the, light his arm on fire or something, make him talk, waterboarding, whatever. But yeah, a little bit of a, you know, you don't have to kill all of them. Does it ever concern you guys when you're watching these movies? And so let's say a gang or a couple people in a gang kill somebody's wife or kill somebody's somebody in the neighborhood. And then a vigilante takes off after that and they, they start killing people, right? Does it ever concern you that we are applauding that? Is, that, is there anything wrong with that or is that just a cathartic release because we wish we could do something to those savages ourselves in the real world? So it's yeah, kind I mean, of like I think there's I think a lot I think there are there are a lot of people that feel that that a certain amount of justice has not been doled out on their behalf. And so that is, I think that is tapping into a, maybe not quite even a subconscious, maybe a conscious <laughs> part that says, you know what, hey, I wish this, you know, somebody could have done this in, in my situation. Or, you know what, this is, I wish somebody in my neighborhood would would pick up that stick and just start cleaning house, whatever the case is. So, yeah, I think there's, there's, I think a lot of people can kind of associate with that. And I also think it is kind of a, probably a negative blight on our society as a as a country is that you know it's just another one of those aspects of violence that we embrace that other other cultures other other countries don't tend to yeah i mean if we're talking in a real life situation i certainly don't think that an eye for an eye is justifiable in my own personal opinion because i don't really think that any of us have the have the ability to determine who lives or dies and to condemn someone who has made that decision by making that decision ourselves, we're just being hypocritical. But at the same, in the same token, when it comes to a movie, the reason people typically seem to immerse themselves into that storyline of a vigilante and kind of root for them is because I think a lot of people have seen either firsthand or, you know, through somebody else, like a third party where someone's been hurt or, you know, they've been taken advantage of or something bad has happened to them and they've seen that person get away. And to be able to watch somebody on screen actually take care of it and get justice for, you know, whomever was wronged in the movie, it maybe it helps them to feel a little bit better that there are people who who care 
about trying to get justice in whatever respect. Because in society, it might not necessarily be that you want that person to die. I mean, you might have those emotions, but even just getting sentenced doesn't always happen. So to be able to watch a vigilante take care of something on screen, while you might not condone it in real life, you're at least getting that release out through your movie experience. So what does it take for you to side with with their violent actions, Brian? Like, what what does it take? And uh, side question, in the real world, if you saw a vigilante, would you applaud them then? <laughs> or would you go, okay, now it's too far. I like it in my entertainment, not necessarily on the subway. Wow. I think as far as what, as far as what, what, what does it take for me to side with their actions? I mean, it, to me, it's about whatever their mission or their crusade is. So I don't think that, I mean, I, I, it's hard to say. It's hard to say specifically. It's a it's a broad spectrum there, and you and unfortunately you have to if you are going to go that route. Yeah, you kind of have to walk a fine line between what's justice and what's what's assault, what's murder, what's you know whatever the case is. So, and it, as far as in the in the real world, yeah, I mean I'm on a subway and and somebody's picking on a couple of kids or whatever and, and a couple of maybe a couple of uh I don't know army vets or something stand up and and beat the crap out of out of uh out of these punks and and run them off the train yeah I'm gonna applaud them all right you know just you know vigilanteism isn't just killing true it's, you true. Know, it's not just killing so uh yeah so if they do something like that absolutely yeah I'm gonna cheer them on you know now if somebody cracks open a beer on that train and somebody else tells them that they, they, Hey, that's you, you're not supposed to be drinking on this train. And then the person smarts off <laughs> and then the person, you know, who's trying to be the, the hall monitor basically <laughs> breaks out a gun and, and shoots them. No, that's, that's a bit too far. Yeah. That's a little extreme. Yeah, that's thanks, a little extreme. So I'm probably scenario. not going to applaud them. I'm, <laughs> that's frowned upon even on the subway street, wherever you're at, it's bad, bad for them. <laughs> Bad form. And also a party killer. Like, seriously, just <laughs> let him have some fun. Yeah, the subway is not yeah. driving. Amanda, what about you? What's it take? Uh, it just has, for me, it has to be justifiable. And for that to happen, I have to, I guess I have to have an understanding not only of what their intentions or mission, as Brian said, are, but also what is your moral code? What, where are, do you have a line where you're like, no, I'm not going to do this? Or it, does everything go for you? Because if everything goes for you, if you don't have some sort of stopping point within yourself, then I don't really feel like you're doing it for the right reasons. I feel like you're just an angry person and you're trying to find a, an excuse to be able to act out on that. So if you're if you're a hero, per se, and you just step in when you feel like it needs to be stepped in and you're trying to save somebody's life or you're trying to help them or you're trying to stop some sort of corruption that isn't being stopped, I feel like I'm I'm totally going to be on your side. And in real life, I'm not going to stop that person. I'm going to, do you need any help? Like, is there anything I can do? Do you need a water or, you <laughs> know? <need> refreshment? <laughs> yeah. Then get back out there? <laughs> yeah. What can I do for you? But when it comes to, when it comes to murder, you have to have a really good reason of why you couldn't find another means of dealing with that. When it comes to, for example, our superhero vigilantes, they don't automatically just go kill people. They try to find another resolution. And worst unless case, unless you're the Punisher, or the Punisher, yeah, unless yeah. you're the Punisher. But in most cases, they're going to try to find a resolution that doesn't result in the ending of somebody's life. So, I mean, I guess that's kind of where I side with them. What about in real life? Would you be, would you be all um the same as Brian? Yeah, oh. I mean, hell yeah. If you're beating somebody up, now I may end up like cringing or turning my head because I can't watch boxing even without getting really sad about I'm it. I'm gonna have to turn around and watch and then hear your ass getting beat. <laughs> no, I mean I might be like, okay, that's enough. You could probably stop now. Like, don't hurt them that badly. Just kind of rough them up, teach them a lesson, I guess. But I don't know. Sometimes it seems like, and it's really sad. It seems like violent people only respond to violence, and I don't know what that is. Why that is. I don't have an alternative, though. So if the only thing that's going to break up a fight is somebody holding on to that person or fighting them off of somebody else, what what else are you going to do? Yeah, I would. I wish more movies would look at 
that a little bit more from a, a truly psychological perspective as opposed to just like, hey, it's always cool. I mean, just really, really get into it because I think there's there's some cool, interesting stuff there. For me, uh, in terms of in movies and TV, when, when they're, they have me on their side is as soon as they've really probably killed or horribly hurt someone in any way, then I'm kind of – it doesn't take me much. Really, it doesn't. Like I'm, I'm automatically slanted toward the vigilante. <laughs> <laughs> You know, as soon as I see them, they're like, hey, guess what? This guy, like, killed 47 people last week, but they were all bad. I'm like, all right, I get it. Yeah. I didn't even have to see the backstory. They have a justifiable reason. Yeah. They're taking out one person to save how many other lives when they already took but 47. But I have to have a reason. I have to have, like, they're – and we're going to talk about that. And it's, actually, we'll just go ahead and segue there. So when – for the ones you do side with, like the vigilantes that you love in movies and TV and stuff – when do they or could they actually lose you? Okay, so I already talked about how I feel like they need to have a moral code or a moral compass. Mm -hmm. When they break from that or they lose focus of what their original intentions were or they become so selfish and one-sided that they can't see past, they get caught up in it. I I've seen numerous movies where the vigilante is, starts off doing it in a very humane way, I guess, per se. And they, they're doing it with a good reason and good intentions. And then somehow they've twisted and they're, they just keep going. They don't know how to stop themselves. That's when you lose me because you had me until you lost yourself. Now, let me ask you, you're, you love Dexter. I do. So my question is, did you support him as a vigilante? Or I, I get you love the show and everything, but did you support him as a vigilante or was that too far just a cool character he was great on screen he was a, he was really interesting to watch and you know i love the show but in terms of strictly looking at him as a vigilante he lost himself he is one of those people where you started to kind of turn your head like is it really necessary for you to do this could you maybe have found a different way dexter ended up getting caught up not continuously and not every time but there were times where he got so wrapped up in wanting to kill and just feeding that inner desire that it he would go out and seek a bad person just so he could fulfill his inner desires and needs and that's a selfish based reason you didn't happen to come across it you weren't put in the situation yeah, where you were subjected it to it you were intentionally going out and you used your vigilanteism, if that's a word, as an excuse to fulfill your inner desires. That's pretty selfish. I mean, if you look at it that way, that's... But I still love the show. I mean, it was still a great show, <laughs> except for the last season. I like the last season. I don't care how many bases. So what about you, Brian? When do they lose you? Can they lose you? Yeah, it's it's really the same thing. It's it's whenever the that that line goes from a, like a hard line that you won't cross to, well, I'm... I'm just well, just this one time, or just, or there's some rationale that I can step over the line this time, and then that line becomes blurry, or that line gets moved back, and that's really what it boils down to. Then you know it's, you know Hugh Jackman really played a for the most part a vigilante in Prisoners, mm -hmm. and he's he's really a good example of the bad version of a vigilante in this movie. So that's kind of that that just. That blind, that just that blind pursuit of I don't I don't care I'm not willing to listen to anything I've got it in my mind this is the this is a these are my thoughts on on the matter and no matter what this is this person is is responsible or these people are responsible and I'm I'm just going to take them out and I'm not going to listen to anybody because I'm just I'm I'm super focused on these people and just I'm just not going to listen to anything else. You know, can't be like that. So that's kind of where you, you lose my support. My big one, and this is what I was alluding to a few minutes ago, is when innocent people get hurt. When you have a vigilante and they're kicking ass, they're taking names, they're cleaning up the neighborhood, they're cleaning up the Slovakian government or whatever random name that they make up for some kind of Isn't national. Isn't Slovakian? No, I'm just making up a name. Oh, okay. But I think it's a real one. Wasn't that in the Avengers? <laughs> it was close to it. <laughs> Sokovia. That's Sokovia. <laughs> so when innocent people get hurt, whenever there are innocent people that either get hurt or killed because of their actions, because they're going after them, that makes it really hard for me to stay on board. It really, really does. But what if they're 
they feel regretful or they feel guilty. Does well, that change it for you? I feel sad that I killed this poor old lady or got her killed, but that doesn't make it any different. She's still dead. So do they still lose your support, though, if, if it they, wasn't they an can intention? Gain it, they can gain it back. Because Punisher is a victim of this. He, he hurts innocent people all the time. You know, they get caught up in his wake. I don't necessarily love the characters anymore, but I enjoy watching them. But they've lost me in terms of their plight. Because mm, I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, okay. Now, before I could stand behind what you were doing, I'm like, all right, I get it, I get it. But as soon as someone innocent gets hurt, I'm like, eh, you lost me. You lost me. I still love you, but I, I just I just don't enjoy you. I don't stand behind what you're, you're saying anymore. That's fair. That's all. All right, so now we're going to talk about something fun. What's the most unnerving thing you've seen a vigilante do? As in, you couldn't believe they went that far. Maybe it even freaked you out, whatever. This was a little hard for me, but the one thing I kind of kept coming back to was, and it really, the the scene itself is not exactly a whole lot of violent or uh, or bloody. Nobody died, I don't think. But it was it was Michael Douglas as the very disgruntled William Foster in Falling Down, mm-hmm. where he just there's a lot of things he gets. He's finally just had enough. And if you've seen the movie, he, he just leaves his car parked in traffic and just walks off. <laughs> but it was the scene where he's in the Korean store and just goes off on the, the store owner, uh, beats him up. He just starts demolishing the place and you know that was kind of that was kind of that that turning point in the movie where you've kind of been on his side you 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 get the everybody's had the frustrations with traffic and 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 all these little things and and you're kind of like all right this guy is actually kind of doing some things i wish i had the backbone to do but that was kind of like the whoa whoa pump the brakes a bit there home skillet it's you're (laughs) it's now you're just being an a-hole so, yeah, yeah. That, that's yep. a tough one to watch because you are kind of I don't want to say you're behind him because his plight's kind of just losing his mind. But there is a good 30, 40 minutes where you're like, all right, I get where he's coming from. And he's hitting like every major stereotype <laughs> right, you've ever yeah. encountered. And you're sitting there going, all right, I could kind of, you know, it's it's horrible, but I kind of get it. And then you get to that one moment and, you're, and you just can't do it anymore. OK, right. I'm, I'm done. That's That's too far. You've just in, you've become a racist. You become, and then I think he goes after the gay people too, right? It's just yeah, everything escalates and it gets worse and worse and worse. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's one of those it's one of those I guess typical paths where the one thing he's kind of fighting against is actually the one thing that he is. Mm-hmm. So just mm. so yeah, that's a good one. All right, what about you, man? What's the furthest, most unnerving thing you've seen a vigilante do? Oh man, okay, so strap in, boys. <laughs> Okay. So, <laughs> rather be strapped in. Than, never mind. Strapped I just, on. I don't know where you were going with that, but <laughs> yeah, I don't I just, necessarily I, want to. I, I, so, in I spit on your grave. I knew this is the movie you're going to pick. <laughs> I knew this was the movie you're going to pick. Uh, it was. This was the easiest question. The on remake, this right? Entire, the remake. Yeah, on right. the entire format. So, in I spit on your grave, the last, basically the last portion of the movie where she's getting her revenge because she was raped. <laughs> She bends one of her rapists over a table, ties his hands behind his back. He's got blood all over his face because Mm. she's kind of been beating him up for a while. She shoves a gun all the way up his ass, continues to, like, pull it out and put it back in and pull it out. As you do. (laughs) Right. She basically violates him the way that she felt she was violated. And the final sequence is where she sets up this little trap. It's not really a little trap. She sets up this trap where, with the gun still up his bum... And the other rapist, Matthew, across from the original one, and the string is attached to Matthew, who's sitting in a chair. And so when he wakes up, the string pulls the trigger on the gun, shoots the gun through the dude's butt, through his (laughs) mouth, and across to Matthew, which means he has like Oh, he got a pull pull bullet. (laughs) And they both die from that. That's killing like, them both. That's like dying from a gunshot wound and dysentery <laughs> or something. Ugh. It is super, super brutal. I I did not expect that at all. 100% was like... Well, thanks for getting the explicit <laughs> tag for this episode. Good job. <laughs> you right. are welcome. Yeah. <laughs> that's unnerving. I'll give yeah, you that. That's unnerving. Yeah. If you if you have So kids, if you're it. looking for a fun family film this weekend, <laughs> I spit on your grave. It's got it wrapped up for you. And then you can watch Frozen. <laughs> 
sing-along version. Clean it up a little bit. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, I'm just moving on from that because I am even Are grossed out. Are you going to bring it up? Are yeah. you going to bring this I need a shower level? now all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah. Suddenly I need to shower. Well, mine is actually far less dramatic than that was. It's And it's really simple. Everybody knows the scene. Liam Neeson in Taken when he rams the nails into that guy's kneecaps. That is I, I scream like a virgin on prom night. I was just <laughs> like <laughs> ah, ah, ah. That's what we, I did. We've we've all we've all banged our knee on something and, <laughs> and just wanted to cry like a little child. And <laughs> but to have something that that brutal kind of punch through there is yeah, that's a whole other level. Right, because you're watching the movie and you're like, he's not gonna do anything else. I mean, he's just gonna it's gonna be one of those interrogation scenes. Where he just, you know, we'll see where this goes and he'll end up threatening him and threatening him and nothing will happen. Nope, nope. He's going right for it. He's actually, this guy's jamming nails and kneecaps. He's shooting women. <laughs> he does not care. He does not care. So I don't even like great. going to the doctor and having them test my reflexes with hitting my knee. No less imagining having nails go through it. Oh, it's brutal. It's a brutal scene. But he talked. So now I got a tip, you know. <laughs> Who needs waterboarding when you have nails? <laughs> exactly. All right. So who is your perfect vigilante? Movie or TV? Your perfect vigilante. Like this is everything you love about vigilante justice, I guess. Uh golly. This is there's so many. And I try to I try to stay away from the comic book stuff. Just uh just mainly because there's they're almost too easy. Uh, because Batman, if you had if you include them, Batman is just the ultimate Mm -hmm. vigilante but going i try to stay something a little bit more grounded a little bit more real somewhat realistic and that was actually clint eastwood in gran torino Mm -hmm. get off my lawn yeah because basically he he sets it up to where he gives his life and the has he tricks the gang into killing him but he sets it up into a sense where the whole neighborhood is watching Mm mm-hmm so, you know, he he basically cleaned up the neighbor. He sacrificed himself for the neighborhood, cleaned the streets. Had the, you know, once once they killed him, everybody there was all the witnesses and the and the cops arrested all the all the bad guys. It was it was uh, kind of one of those higher level thinking type deals. I agree. That's actually a really good one because that's a movie I, I think that it doesn't get appreciated as much as I would like it to. Mm-hmm. But really well done, actually. And I think Clint Eastwood gave a great performance, even even though he's really just being an amplified version of himself in his previous right. roles. It's still like it's still a great, great performance. Amanda, who's your favorite or I'm sorry, your perfect vigilante film or TV? So in the last question, remember how I said that was the easiest one on this format? Mm-hmm. I lied. I was wrong. This is the easiest one. OK. Hands down. The easiest question you could have given me. Boondock Saints. The McManus brothers. Really? Yes. 100%. Because I, they kill a cat? <laughs> they don't mean to. They feel a little guilty, but I'm then they I'm still laugh. okay with it. <laughs> no, I'm not. Cats are cool. They, uh, ooh, I'm keeping that forever. It's not true. I don't like cats. <laughs> they, they still have a code. They get into it kind of more as just like a defense mechanism, I guess. Mm-hmm. And then they're kind of like, we're actually pretty good at this. I mean, why don't we keep doing it? But when you reach the end of the movie and they're giving – they're in the courtroom and they they have the guns pointed at the man who they think is going to get away basically because, I mean, it is a courtroom and this is America. And they start to talk about how we don't want your women, we don't want your children, we don't want your poor or your hungry. We basically – we just want the bad people. That's all we care about. We're not going to hurt anybody else here. Mm-hmm. Just let us do our thing and we're out. And even – really gay Willem Dafoe understands that. He recognizes that as a cop with the most hilarious Weird, weird that that had to be mentioned, but okay. <laughs> because yeah. he smacks a dude at... It's, yeah, anyway, it's ridiculous. I got you. Anyway, so they, there are other characters in the movie that recognize their, their efforts and what their code is and what their mission is. And I can 100% stand behind that because they don't want to hurt anybody else that doesn't need to be hurt. They're not going to. They make it known that this is our platform. We are just doing it to get rid of the bad people. That's it. They don't want anything out of it. They could go and, and rob a bank and take all of this money. And instead, they use their efforts to protect Boston. <sighs> I love them. 
All right. The shepherds we shall be. <laughs> we got it. I got it. That's a good that's a good I love that movie. So even though I, I know people will often say it's not really a good movie. Well, you know They're what? Wrong. You'd be surprised how many people, movies people love <laughs> are not really that good. So the characters were great. All right. Well, my pick is from a, pro- a property nobody knows. <laughs> Sadly. Sadly, I'm the only one that knows it. If you've never heard me mention it, Mr. Chapel from Vengeance Unlimited is my favorite vigilante and film or TV of all time. It ran on ABC for, I think it was just 16 or 18 episodes for one season. It starred Michael Madsen as this guy who would help people who've been screwed over. And they either, at the end of the, at the end of the mission or the end of what, his work, they either owed him a favor, usually to help somebody else down the line, or a million dollars, one or the other. And believe it or not, every once in a while, he would get the million dollars. So it was <laughs> kind of interesting. But the reason why he's my favorite vigilante is because he never used violence, ever. He, he used manipulation the entire time. What his, what his mission was or what he chose to do for his vigilante efforts was, for example, one person killed someone's husband. And so what he did is he rounded up a cadaver and he played with the circumstances and basically set it up framing that person, framing the original killer for someone else's murder. So he set it up so that they still got framed for the same thing. Mm. They were punished in a different way. They were caught for something else because they he didn't want them to go free. For somebody who stole other people's money, he would set it up so that they lost all their money. You know, you can see what I'm saying. That's yeah. how the show was set mm-hmm. up, and that's what Mr. Chappell did. Not violent, but still breaking the law to, to fix where the law failed in many respects. And I, I just love... The psychological madness of it, because he was also kind of nutty. He's Michael Madsen at the pro- mm. at his prime, so he was he was like it was like watching um, Mr. Blonde from Reservoir Dogs mm-hmm. be the good guy, mm. and it was insane. I loved it. I loved that show. Like I was so mad. It was at least fifteen to twenty years ahead of its time, because antiheroes were not a thing then. Everything had to be Kirk Cameron esque and stuff. <laughs> Man, it was a great show. He was a great. Vigilante and the kind I want. I would want to hang out with him just to see how his brain ticked. You should uh, plug that to some execs and see if they will. They love reboots right now. Yeah, well, so, usually they only reboot stuff people know, and nobody knows that. But me and my brother Brad, I think. So, <laughs> but you can give it a shot. You Make- can't. You can't even buy them. Like you can't buy the the disc. What? My brother had to find them on the internet somewhere so I can watch them again. <laughs> Fine. You found them. The internet holds no secrets. 